This episode is brought to you by Summer School Electronics. With pedals like the Snow Day Delay, the Pep Rally Fuzz, the Trash Panda, and my personal favorite, the Science Fair, which is two classic dirt pedals in one with a mid-boosted overdrive on one side, a black lab rat circuit on the other, and a blend knob to blend between them to find the perfect classic stacked dirt sound you're looking for, it's hard not to find something you'll love. Mark builds all of his pedals by hand in Syracuse, New York, where he also works as a full-time educator. In addition to the super fun graphics on their pedals, Mark also offers custom artwork. Want your dog's face on a pedal? He can do it. Want your face on a pedal? He can make that happen too. Go over to summerschoolelectronics.com and make sure to tell them that 40 Watt Podcast sent you. Forty Waters, welcome to this week's episode of Forty Watt Podcast. I'm excited to be with you again. We've got a few things to cover. First of all, my name is Philip. I'm your host. Um, so I need to talk about sponsors of this podcast, mainly because I love the work they do, and you know they they make sure this show keeps going. Um, subtext: they pay me, um, but that's also because I really like what they're doing. I only take on sponsors that I really love the products they make. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Grez Guitars. Barry over at Grez is making some of the coolest guitars on the planet. Uh, highly recommend them. I have a couple myself. I've been playing around with his new Bass 6 that he put together. I've got a loner here. Um, and it has given me an existential crisis when it comes to bass playing. Uh, but I won't, I won't talk too much about that. Go over, check the links down in the description below. Go look at Barry's Instagram. Go check out the website. Uh, he builds with reclaimed redwood which is really rad because i don't know if you know this but redwood's a protected species and you can't farm it you can't make guitars out of it unless you're getting it from sources where it's already been used so when they when they tear down bridges and buildings over there in california barry goes and reclaims as much of it as he can he builds his tops out of those sometimes the guitar out of it and they're incredible they're super resonant i can't say enough wonderful things about them that's why i own a couple of them uh, also, this episode is brought to you by Summer School Electronics. Uh, Mark was recently featured on the JHS show with his new class reunion pedal. It is a uh, big muff and a tube screamer in one enclosure with a blend knob between the two. It's pretty spectacular. I really enjoy it. I've actually got it on my baseboard because I think it makes a great bass overdrive. So, again, check Mark's links down below and uh, go... Go make sure you buy something from him because I buy everything. He doesn't have that many pedals. Go buy them all. All right. Sales pitch over. We're going to get into this week's episode. I'm really, really excited. This has been an episode that's been in the works uh, for a little while now. We've got Clark and Cassandra from Amp RX. Am I? We actually say the RX, right? That's correct. Okay. Because yes. for a long time, I... I'll, I'm going to be honest. I was one of those people that thought the company was Brown Box, but that's the product you make, and it's Ampar AmpRX is the company. That's a awesome. common uh, misconception. Yeah, that's fair. It's fair. Um, I mean, it is it, it is the primary thing y'all make. It's what y'all do. It's what y'all are known for. Um, I've I don't own one, but I've used them in the past, and it's such a cool box and. Some people are like, why don't you just buy a uh, Variac? I'm like, because I don't want to carry a Variac around in a gig bag. Um, but before we get into what y'all make and what y'all do, let's talk about how y'all got into this. Like, how did you get down this crazy road where you're running uh, a company building basically amp accessory is the way I think of it. Um, <laughs> sure. So uh, Cassandra and I are both musicians. Uh, I'm a bass player and Cassandra is a violinist, a uh, fiddle player. And, um, basically it took the pandemic for us to begin doing something different. Um, at least in our, our current lives in Nashville, uh, both of us have, uh, many current, uh, different lives, uh, previous, which we will learn more about. Um, for example, Cassandra has a degree in IE. Industrial, oh, wow. Industrial engineering. Yeah, yeah, industrial engineering. Which people may not uh, know. But basically, we were both touring. The pandemic hit. And we started doing some real estate stuff and flipping some houses together, uh, finding out that we actually 
did like each other a lot because we were able to work on houses <laughs> together and not kill each other or break up. And uh, we flipped a house and then we saw that Pat was selling his company. And Pat is the inventor of the brown box. And he actually posted it on Instagram. Oh, that's awesome. And Cassandra said, wouldn't it be crazy if we bought Pat's company and moved it to Nashville? So I was, I also play electric violin as part of my repertoire of instruments. And I used the brown box in the past. So I knew Pat personally. I was on the artist roster. I have, we have like a vintage Cassandra brown box artist poster. It's pretty cool. Very cool. Um, and, but when he posted that, I was like, it was literally a week within a week of when we finished this last project that we were doing. And me, I was like, I don't want to be a construction worker anymore. That was fun while it lasted, but what are we going to do next? Here comes Pat on Instagram. And I was, I, was, I said to Clark, I was like, it's going to be a crazy phone call, but like, let's just see what happens. And here we are. Here we are. <laughs> yeah. That's really rad. That's it's such a, it's so weird to see uh, things like that where somebody makes a post and I, I, I missed that post, but of course it was during the pandemic and other things going on. It's a crazy time. Um, and like posting companies for sale, it's like just Instagram. Hey, does anybody want to do this? Like I, I think it's funny what Smashing Pumpkins just posted on social media. They were looking for a new guitarist. And of course, Kiki Wongo is is their new guitarist, which is really, really yeah. rad. But um, I love this world of Instagram where it's people building connections and building these opportunities and, and just reaching out to a, such a large community. I really like Instagram. It's my favorite social media at this point, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Definitely. For sure. So the whole, I'm I'm trying to put a little bit together. So, you have you have a degree in industrial engineering, yeah. And you're you're bought you're flipping houses like that's a. I realize there's a little bit of a correlation there. Like there's similarities. Well, you know, I think what what it actually comes down to what I say an engineering degree really gives you is a stamp on your forehead that you're a creative problem solver. You can okay. think through things. You can sort of systematically dismantle obstacles whether they're tangible or not that's sort of like when I sum up what I learned in engineering school or my engineering education that's what I that's what I really draw upon now and I think that it's a the fact that we got into the house flipping stuff it's just a testament of Clark and I being problem solvers wanting to be productive wanting to be creative with our time um you know taking puzzles apart and putting them back together. It's, yeah. it's basically, it's basically what that is. And we had the perfect storm in the beginning of 2020, right? Because we were both full-time musicians mm -hmm. and everything that we did, everything just got canceled one day. March 14th. So, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we, we had this house, we, we found a house to flip. And at the time we had nothing but time. Like we had YouTube and yeah, we we were quarantined together so we were able to work on the house together the house was an absolute disaster it was a mess so we couldn't really screw it up yeah right you know it's it, uh it, we had a lot of experimental time in there and like i said time on your hands wanting to be interested in solving problems and that was a perfect recipe for us getting into that that's awesome it's funny how we remember the start of the pandemic so well i remember because i i started a new job the job I'm in now, uh, on February 1st of 2020. Oh, and wow. then, and then I was in, I was actually in Nashville for a conference and the day I left was the day the tornado hit. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And then, wow. yeah. Cause I was at music city center, uh, at a conference and left. And then the, you know, as I got home, I see all the news of the weather that came, like followed. I left, it came. And wow. then, then we closed on the new house on March 13th. And then the very wow. next week, the world fell apart. So, oh my wow. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. We, we did have a, you know, we did have some time at home to organize everything in the new house. So I totally can relate to this. You've got this house and you've got time on your hands. So, yeah. yeah. And it was yeah. really the, the whole experience was really empowering looking back and our lives going forward because, you know, a lot of like, House renovations are things that you do with, with your hands, basically, that you don't know how to do before. 
you learn how to do it, you do it successfully, and it really sort of teaches you every moment that you can learn how to do things that you didn't know how to do before. Things that most people think don't think about or they think are impossible. Like we're always ready ready to try to learn how to do something. Um, and I, I give it a lot of that experience, a lot of that credit. Also, yeah. just being a musician, you like hear something you want to play and you suck for a while. And then one day you suck Some of less. us suck at it a whole lot longer than <laughs> others. And then someday you're like, man, I'm like kind of doing this. It's it's attributing that, but to other things as well. Yeah. Like I learned that I was more than just a bass player, really, in the pandemic is really what happened. Yeah. And that I just like solving problems, whether it be plumbing problems or, you know, bass chord problems or whatever, you know, whatever it is. We'll be right back. This podcast is supported in part by String Joy Strings. I'm a snob. At least that's what people tell me. I'm never okay with good enough, and that's where String Joy Strings come in. They're better than good enough. They're the best. String Joy are making some of the finest strings available today right up the road from me in Nashville, Tennessee. They offer custom sets, balanced tension, coated strings, the works. If you need it, they can probably make it happen. You should be using String Joy Strings, and if you're going to order from them, you really could help this podcast out by clicking the affiliate link down in the description or show notes below. You get amazing strings, I get a little bit of that back to help the show keep going. It's a win-win situation. Get your String Joy Strings today. So, and and that's such, so interesting that you took over in the pandemic, and I really feel like the impact of y'all's leadership in the company has been really, really visible because um, prior to that time, I sort of, you know, I knew about the brown box and a lot of other people who are into vintage amps at the time where I, I play a, a 1970 Super Reverb is is my favorite amp that I've I've owned. I've owned it for now almost 20 years. Um, and so I heard about brown box, a friend of mine had one and you'd see them in like vintage guitar magazine, the ads in the, in the magazines and stuff like that. But there really wasn't that much of a, like a, a presence of brown box. And it feels like in the last few years, y'all have really ramped up the presence of brown box. I mean, I've seen y'all now at NAM. I've seen you at uh, the Amigo guitar show in Nashville um, a few months ago. Um, how has taking that on and trying to build the visibility of a company like AmpRX um, been for y'all and how, I mean, it's gotta be a similar experience to, to any other problem solving, right? Yeah, absolutely. You want to take this? Sure. I mean, I think that there's many answers to that question. It's been, it's been a challenge, but I, what I, we always stand behind is that the product is really great. So it's sort of a matter of us, letting people know what it is. We realize that our main, our main challenge, our main obstacle is actually just education about almost like the science behind it. Like, what is this thing? What is, what is, why does voltage matter? What's going on in the amplifier? It's not like, it's almost, it's marketing, but it's not like sales marketing the way that you would think about it. And it applies to so many people in so many different situations. I think that uh, prior to our leadership, it was sort of like it sort of naturally pigeonholed itself a little bit into the vintage market, but we're like, no, there's so many people who are using it for all these other applications and um, just getting out there and meeting people and taking opportunities as they come, knowing that we have a great product to stand, stand on is um, really the key. And, and Pat, like Pat is the inventor of the Brown box. He invented it it selfishly because he was trying to get a guitar tone and he yeah. couldn't get it. He had a yeah. problem and he solved it. So like his problem wasn't telling people about brown boxes. His problem was I can't get this Frampton tone off of this record and I've got the guitar, I've got the amp, I've got the pedals. I have all of the years correct, but I'm still not getting the right tone. What do I need to do? And he had an electronics background. And so that's why he invented the brown box, dropped the voltage, and finally found that tone. So I I feel like that he definitely wanted people to learn about brown box and to to have brown boxes. But our 
our main goal right now is just education and educating people about just trying trying to have people the three seconds before you plug into the wall going, what am I actually doing here? Like what what's actually going on? depending on if they think past their house and to the mains or all the transformers that it goes through to get to the city. What is the city really feeding me here? Um, because a lot of times you don't think about it. You just plug it in and then something breaks and you're like, I don't know, I don't know what happened. Never. People, you don't, you just, we are, we take electricity totally for granted. Yeah. We absolutely do. It, it's, it's a constant thing and it, we expect it to be there. And then it, it, we know, we know how for granted we take it because every time there's a power outage, there's a complete and utter freak out. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it's yeah. completely wild. Yeah. So let's, let's take a, a quick step back. Cause I realize I may have skipped a very important step for my listeners that somehow don't know what Brown box is and what it does. Let's give the elevator pitch. Let's give the overview. What is Brown box? How is it used? Why is it important? Take it, Cassandra. This is a brown there, box. For you YouTube viewers, it is uh, on screen for you. For listeners, go over to YouTube. You can see it. The brown box is a tool that allows you to supply the correct power to your tube gear. That's the one sentence. Yeah. yeah. Every piece of tube gear has a sweet spot where it's going to run most efficiently, uh, most safely, and sound the best and last the longest. And this allows you to find that voltage and then run the gear at that voltage consistently wherever you are. Dep no, no matter what the, the date, the time is, you're always going to be able to monitor it and supply your tube gear with that. And for those people that are listening and not watching, it is a brown box. box. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's literally a brown <laughs> box. <laughs> That's the descriptors for it. So technically it's a voltage attenuator, but we stay away from the A word. Because yeah. people are dead in the eyes. Sometimes <laughs> even voltage people are like asleep already. Yeah. So, come on, man. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it is technically an attenuator, but we stay away from the A word. It's not a signal attenuator. It takes the voltage out of the wall. It goes between the wall and your amp. So you plug this into the wall. You find out what the voltage is coming out of the wall, which will be usually surprisingly a lot higher than you think it's going to be. And then you can use these um, controls to reduce the voltage to mm. the proper. It's got a good switches too. It's, nice. it's really satisfying. I'm not going to lie. The last <laughs> time I was at Shell's booth, I just turned the switches a couple of times it's because vicious. it's really, really satisfying. Very important. I, I don't think everyone can appreciate the the satisfaction in turning a good switch <laughs> like I can. No. Um, I, 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 it's, a, it's a weird fixation. I know. Um, I'm, I'm that way with guitars and amps. When you turn the knob, even on a good, on a, an amp where it's obviously a cheap potentiometer, you feel, you feel it. Oh, it, for it, sure. It, oh yeah. Yeah. It, it's the, it's the knob equivalent of the wooden tongue depressors doctors used to use in your tongue. They give oh, me chills. Wow. I hate them. I hate them. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's so sorry. That's a really weird analog. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I actually have uh, so my my spare bedroom that I call a studio space here. Um, I keep a uh, power conditioner that gives me the readout of the voltage it's receiving on it. Yeah. And most of the time, it's a very steady one hundred and twenty. But some days I come in here and it's showing me, oh, what's it one hundred and twenty six today? Yeah. Or it's and it's almost never below one hundred and twenty. It's always too hot. It's always yeah. running hot and. And a lot of people have made this argument, and, and I'll see how you'll stand on it, because like, some people are like, oh, modern amps don't really need it, because they're designed for that higher voltage. And in a lot of ways, they are. That doesn't mean they can't benefit from being, uh, have that voltage fed just a little lower. And Because I know one of my loves in amplifiers is a tube rectifier, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you slam an amp with a tube rectifier with a lot of signal, as that rectifier tries to, I'm not going to try to get into the technical terms because I have some electrical engineers who listen to this podcast and they're going to correct me. But that sag comes from it trying to deliver that wattage as well. And I love that sound. And this is a way you can start to get a little bit of that vibe out of all of your amps, well, all of your tube amps. I don't really know what this would do for a solid state amp. I can't imagine it's very helpful, to be honest. 
But uh, I want to hear about the challenges of marketing um, a tool because it's not a it's not a sexy product to people. This is this is the kind of thing people hate buying. It's well, not a it's not a sexy product, but we try to make it enjoyable. And if you can make people instead of making Instead of people feeling good because it's a sexy product, you make them feel good because they feel safer about their gear. And and that can be sexy in and of itself. Like taking away, like say you didn't know that it was 126 in your studio. Right. And you were playing and you were changing all the settings on your amp, your pedals don't sound right, and you have an extremely frustrating two hours of guitar playing. And you don't know why. Yeah. Like for me going in and knowing that it's going to be consistent and I know what's going to happen. And at least like, it's going to be me. That's going to be the problem. That's going to be different rather than my gear Yeah, is a sexy thing is an enjoyable yeah. thing. And so if I can, you know, eliminate more of the issues, I know that my, I love how my gear sounds at this club. And then I go to this club, you know, maybe it's the voltage. It maybe it's your shirt, but maybe it's the voltage as well. Right? Yeah. You know, that's it's funny that you say it's not sexy. I've been kind of make I make my joke, the my headline. I'm I've been just I'm just trying to make voltage attenuation funny and sexy. That's like my job. <laughs> trying to make it. But you know, we could fill a whiteboard with the math behind why this is scientifically important. But we're going to talk about the filament voltage and how it's supposed to be 6.3 or below and like how these tubes respond to that and how these ones don't really. And it doesn't matter for those, but it's really important for those. Okay, we'll fill up a whole whiteboard with all this math. But actually, we can just wipe it clean and say, have you ever played a gig where you're in a complete flow state where you feel like you're just connected to your guitar and it's like all like all one line from your head to your heart, to your hands, to the instrument, to the amp, to the audience. And it's just like, that's why we do this. There's that. And it's all, it's just very, very in the moment. And that's, you know, why we're playing that feeling is what everyone's always going after. You ever had that gig? Yeah. You have. Oh, yeah. have you also had the gig? where every connection is severed from your head to your heart, to your instrument, to your hands, nothing, like nothing is coming out. It's like you're tongue tied and you can't get any notes out. It's not sounding right. It's not feeling right. And then what happens in your head is that toilet bowl of spiraling thoughts and your gig just gets worse and worse and worse. Yeah. I mean, heaven forbid you're on in ears that night for the love of God. Like, you know what I mean? And it's just, that is like, I've, we've, and we've all had those gigs, right? Yeah. So in a lot of these situations, you've got, you, you got your pedals and you have the dials marked. You've got it all marked yeah. where your settings are. You got, ex everything is exactly dialed in from last night. Clark likes to say you're wearing the same underwear too. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> like everything's exactly the same but you're playing in a different club. It's the voltage. That's why your amp sounds different. It's electric guitar. Mm -hmm. Can't it forget matters. about it. You know, it matters. So um, that's like wiping the whiteboard and saying like, have you ever felt like that? And you want to feel like that less? <laughs> I feel that, like it, it, it allows it. you to take one worry, another worry away from your, cause we have a, you know, depending on your band or your gig or what you're doing, there's lots of things to worry about. For example, when my band plays, which is rare these days, but back when I was playing, uh, you know, is my primary source of income. There was, um, I got to book the gig. I've got to make the set list. I've got to get the players together. I've got to get there to set up. I've got a sound check. We've got a, um, Oh, I got to make sure if we're doing merch, which we usually didn't cause I played in, you know, crab you know tiny little uh dive blues bars um but if there is merch you got to get that set up you got to you know settle things with the house then you've got to worry about your rig or is all everything working is there any right. patch cable issues do i have power can't tell you i can tell you it's twice i've forgotten power cable for my pedal board that's always nerve-wracking um and so take one more worry away because i equate the problem with voltage it's the it's the thing Okay, this is going to be dumb, but this is the analogy that popped in my head. Problems with grounding 
are like natural gas leaks. Hmm. It's Hmm. obvious. You know when natural gas is leaking, right? You absolutely recognize it. Problems with voltage are radon. You have no clue if you don't have any way of monitoring it and knowing it. And that's what's messing up your entire vibe, your entire sound. It's what's driving you crazy. And But you can't see that as easily as you can yeah. tell, oh, this bar has a grounding problem because I can only stand right here. This is it. Right. I'm cemented in this spot and not get hum. So, like yeah, it's that's a total ADHD mind flight. Uh, but that's what it feels like. And yeah. so I play and have played some pretty amazing venues and I've played the hole in the wall re- thing that's, you know, it's it's been a building for a hundred years and it's gone through, it was a cotton grading manufa- cotton grading facility, then it was a mechanic shop and then it was a this and then it was finally a blues bar. Yeah. And the, I remember I played this one place where they just told me there found out there was no actual ground for the building. Like when they put in the electricity, nobody bothered to put in the, the grounding rod. Like, so wow. I was like, Oh, so I could die here. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Right. Um, good to know. Don't touch the strings and the microphone at the same time. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um, and this just gives you consistency mm-hmm. across your entire sound uh, when you're playing in unknown situations. Totally. Um, yeah. And it's unknown. I mean, every, everything is actually unknown with the, with the voltage at any, any time and place. And I will say even, even further than that, it's not just the hole in the walls venues. Yeah, it's, totally. it's, it's just like in the city of Nashville, the voltage goes up and down all day long because they're, they're pumping so much in trying to accommodate for uh, the massive amounts of people doing massive amounts of things, running ACs, heaters and all that. Every single time we've gone to the Ryman to drop off something for an artist, it's been over 125 volts. Wow. You know, so it's not just like bad grounding at the hole in the wall place. It's like it can be literally anywhere. It could be at your home. It could be at the Ryman Auditorium. You know, it could be any city, any place. Yeah. At any time. But this gives you the knowledge to be able to lay that consistent base. And like I said, it's, it's electric guitar. What's happening is your signals are meeting electricity and becoming music. So it's the main, it's like the main ingredient in the dish and it's shouldn't be ignored. Yeah. I think electric guitarists uh, and, and other musicians who use electric instruments, but especially the weirdos that play electric guitar, um, we get really, really fixated on guitar pedals and Mm. uh there's a whole lot out there on youtube y'all have all seen the videos of people talking about oh you need isolated power supplies and you need to make sure you're powering your pedals appropriately to get the right sound and uh you know you don't want to underpower and like there's just enormous amounts of material out there on youtube and the internet talking about powering pedal boards but there isn't that much talking about powering amps and powering right. your tubes and making sure you're getting that same consistency there. Right. Sure. And really but, it's, it's lethal amounts of voltage going through amplifiers. It's like not 12 volts. <laughs> yeah. It's this isn't just a zap. Volts. If you get zapped, no, it's not 12 yeah. volts going to a power. Like, yeah, definitely. Like you should power all of your gear safely and efficiently, but the way that you describe that so much conversation goes into powering pedals, but actually it's like a high voltage situation and amplifiers and people don't talk about it as much is, is very interesting. Yeah. And I, I think it's interesting because I see once I, once I became aware of Brown box, um, you know, before, before y'all took over in there, uh, but I'd be looking at stages. I'd be watching Austin city limits and I'm seeing, brown box on the stage next to their amps or i went to see um this past weekend um it may be the weekend before listeners as of the recording of this but i went to see the wallflowers finally bucket list you know absolutely love love jacob dylan and the wallflowers got to see them down here in philadelphia mississippi and they're just they're you know they're playing the convention center at a casino kind of thing and so i'm pretty sure uh it, so it was um, 
three guitars, counting Jacob Dylan, six amps, because everyone's using two amps, like, you know, men after my own heart. Um, right. And every one of them was on a brown box. Really? Like, cool. Yeah. It, awesome. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I know, I know for sure one was. I distinctly think I remember seeing everyone on them. Um, I don't know if the bassist was using a brown box, but he was also using a solid state class D head. So, you know, boo on him. Um, uh-huh. That's okay. Get tubes, man. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh-huh. Obviously, he's a pro. He knows what he's doing. Um, so, with all this going on, taking over this company, do y'all still have time to play? Do y'all still gig? Um, we go through different spurts of, uh, it seems like Cassandra will get called for a couple months and then I'll get called for a couple months. Um, Cassandra, uh, toured with an Indian Bollywood artist. That um, sounds awesome. It is awesome. Pretty awesome. <laughs> um, before the pandemic, but also did a tour, um, in 2021, 2022, 22, 22, yeah, 22, 23. So I was trying to tour internationally while. <laughs> so he's the, like the artist that I play with is one. He's the biggest um, music star in Indian music history. I have the biggest gig that you've never heard of. Um, and I tried <laughs> to, uh, I tried to do uh, international touring and Brown box at the same time. It was sort of just like. Impossible. Impossible. Yeah. <laughs> But we still play. Um, I'm not doing that currently. But like Clark said, since there's two of us, we work together really well to um, hand off sort of like how Clark said, if I'm out doing something, he's around to make sure the the ship is steered. And like right now, Clark's doing a bunch of gigs. Clark always does a lot of sessions too. So we're, I I feel like I'm in a position to do play what I want to play. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That there it's a great position to be in where you're not reliant on taking every gig that's thrown your way to make a oh, living. Yeah. Um that was why I I told people like back when I made a living playing and it was barely a living, let's be honest. Um at the moment I got a full-time gig, I was like, I don't know, this feels pretty good. Steady income, <laughs> insurance, this is great. I miss playing yeah. live, but I kind of also like being able to go to the doctor when I'm sick. So <laughs> Yeah. For, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I have work? to What's that? No, go ahead. Sorry. I was, I have to take this second to briefly talk about Bollywood. My, my first experience with Bollywood. The only reason I'm even familiar with it at all. Uh, when I was in college, I did a stint for a couple of semesters as an English major. And I took a class simply called Jane Austen. And the instructor for that class was the South's foremost expert on Jane Austen. Wow. Um, no one wants to talk to me about Jane Austen though. Cause I'm not a fan. Um, but she played, there is a Bollywood version of pride and prejudice called bride and prejudice. And it is insanely fun to watch. And so I have to just throw wow. that out there. Let it's super, it's a super fun, super fun, goofy movie that, uh, that was my first experience in Bolly Bollywood and it was That's great. Wild. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, highly it's, recommend uh, that one. It's um the for people that like are are thinking of Bollywood, like the more classic Bollywood is is I think what a lot of people think about. Yeah. The modern stuff is just like pop music with Indian influence. Yeah. And it's like really cool. It's like kind of fusiony a little bit. It's like there's some the band's doing some stuff. It's like really cool music. Oh yeah, there's there's definitely um there's a difficulty level there that's yeah. underappreciated because it's under like this this very pop feel. Like for example, Bride and Prejudice had very much had a Mamma Mia feel to it. Oh, at, wow. Like to the whole movie. Yeah. So um I don't know. That's just a weird random memory that got triggered that I, I needed cool. to get out there. I'll tell you what, though, all of those songs played live by real bands are slamming. I I bet. How'd how'd you end up in that gig? That's the thing I have to wonder. Oh, well, you know, so I was uh, playing fiddle in downtown Nashville for quite a while. And, um, you know, I it was one of those overnight success stories that takes like 10 years. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Somebody that I'm 
sort of was colleagues with in the music industry for like nine years, brought another colleague of theirs to see me play one night. And then six months later, the artist that I play for was looking to form a band that was for a specific tour and it would be his music featuring quote unquote world musicians. And so there were 11 or 12 people from all around the, all all around the world representing different countries and instruments. And um, the fiddle, the American fiddle is a world instrument to um, Indians. So I got the spot as the American fiddle player. I was no, no pressure. No no pressure. pressure. I was representing the U S of a, (laughs) <laughs> on God's favorite instrument, the four string fiddle. <laughs> Can we please make this make this an Olympic sport now? Like the like, <laughs> representatives in, in all of the various. Yeah. Uh, That'd be yeah. Awesome. It was absolutely magical. So yeah, it was re- so like the follow up question is usually, did I have to learn all, a bunch of different Indian scales and everything like that? And the answer is no, because I was actually. I mean, I got exposed to a lot of things and a lot of things have come to me through osmosis of playing these songs, but he wanted me to be there to be me. Yeah. He wanted you to be an American fiddle player. Yeah. He was said I was to be Cassandra, which is the coolest that you could ever. It's the coolest ever. It was just like life changing for me, you know, that I'd look forward to uh, having a career like this since I was a little kid. And then to have the honor of somebody uh, like that ask me to just be myself. That's super rad. That's really rad. And it's a cool experience to have like a life goal like that realized. Uh, Did you, when it was all over, did you feel a letdown? Like, what do I do now? Was there any of that? Oh, so this is actually kind of funny. I mean, I actually, they, they're they're not like the best communicators. So actually, (laughs) I thought it was over like many times just because <laughs> I wasn't sure. not like in a bad way, but like they didn't really like, they don't confirm you like ahead of time on things. So actually I got the gig. They asked, they asked to hire me and I was like, we negotiate a little bit. And I said, yes. And then they were like, okay, can you do it? Can you come in three days? <laughs> like they're like very much on that kind of timeline. So, wow. So like at the end of the first tour that I did, I wrote the artist this handwritten letter, like thanking him for changing my life and how I had the most incredible journey. And I like gushed it out on this piece of paper and gave it to him before our very last show. And he was like, got your letter. Thanks. Love you. And um, he's really, really amazing and humble and cool. But anyways, like two weeks later, they WhatsApp group texted us and was like, Hey, uh, the next three shows are, (laughs) (laughs) are in dubai and abu dhabi and wherever and i was like i just wrote this really ridiculously emotional thank you letter as it i was like i wanted to call him and be like i wrote that because i thought i was never going to see you again like i'm very thankful but i probably (laughs) wouldn't have written it like that i think i had like tears in my eyes when i gave it to him or something like it was really dramatic and they were like, cool, so in three weeks, we're going to do this. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, actually, like, nothing's really over. Nothing's really ever over. Oh, that's so wild. And sort of like, you're like, hey, could you just read that again, like, later, when like <laughs> yeah, we're actually like when done? It, when it but, is over. Yeah. Yeah, 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 when it actually is over. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah like, wild. when the pandemic hit. So everything that I was doing before the pandemic was purely international. So... I like anything that I was doing with him, like did not come back for a full two years. There was no, just like, you know, and like Nashville kind of picked back up in like eight or 10 months. The country music touring scene picked back up in about Mm -hmm. a year. Like, yeah, there was nothing for me. And and during that time I was like, Oh my God, am I ever going to do anything like this again? Like in that, that middle of 2020, when we were all like, Oh my God, is this ever going to end? Yeah. Right. (laughs) Uh, I definitely had that feeling because you can't, I mean, I played for like state, I was playing like stadiums and stuff. Yeah. You know, it's like, gotta be hard to come down from that. It's I'm trying, it's, you know, it's really hard to come down from that. And it's like hard to go anywhere from that actually sure. too. Especially when she's just seeing me every day and we're just <laughs> up with dollars and wondering if we're ever going to see anyone ever again. Yeah. It, so, and everybody. Yeah. 
Well, it's it's funny because I to put it in a, a really grand, grossly grandiose scale. It, it the reason I asked that whole about coming down from that. Do you feel like what do I do now? Because I I remember so I studied audio engineering first at MTSU and then I moved to Delta State University, very small university. Um, but Norbert Putnam had started a program there in audio engineering. And so I moved there, finished my degree there in music and audio engineering. And I remember sitting around with Norbert and Norbert was friends with George Harrison from the Beatles. Right. And so he talked about a time he had gone over to England, hanging out with George Harrison on his estate, walking the gardens with George and, and George told him, uh, just confided in him that, you know, I'm depressed. And Norbert's like, wait, hold up, what? Hold on. You played in the most successful rock band of all time, still to this day, the most successful rock band of all time. Um, you got the beautiful wife, beautiful uh, family, this great house. Like, what do you have to be depressed about? He said, yeah, but by the time I was 28, it was all over. What do you do after that? Yeah. yeah. So not that not that it was quite the Beatles, nothing is quite the Beatles. So, but yeah, it's an interesting thing when you accomplish something that you thought would take you your whole life to accomplish and then you accomplish it and you're like, "Oh, where do we go from there?" Sure. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, to that point though, we our lives have changed dramatically since getting brown box since since the pandemic but then also since taking on the role of taking on this company and i think the way to navigate through life when it comes to that question is to keep doing things that you don't know how to do right so you know and especially in the with brown box where even though brown box is a established product the company is very much a startup yeah so we we bought there wasn't a whole lot of business infrastructure. Like, you know, Brown Box was already carried in a lot of dealers, but like, it, it wasn't like buying a corporation. Like, you know, so we, we got to really start the business that how, how we wanted to run it from scratch. And it is actually in a startup type phase. So every day is like almost day one. Like there's always something. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's, that's how you uh, combat that. I think. Yeah, so to piggyback on that is like enjoying the journey. Like it's about the journey. It's not about the result or the goal or whatever. Have goals, but enjoy the journey. Yeah. I, I feel that I, when I, in, in the same way, not that I'm nearly the end of like being a guitar player and I've not reached the peak of my guitar playing, at least God, I hope not. Um, <laughs> Cause that would be incredibly depressing. Um, but at the same time, I'm sort of like, uh, I need, something else to focus on because you know you get to a point where you're like just playing the same old stuff you've always played and you're like i'm not growing anymore and so yeah. i started learning pedal steel and if you don't want to be depressed i don't recommend learning pedal steel that's all i'm saying um it's a it's, it's a tough instrument. instrument it it's just, impossible my brain still i i was looking <laughs> i thought i'd be smart and look up like because I have like a background in music theory. Like I thought I was going to teach college music theory. That's what yeah. I was going to do. I was going to yeah. get a master's in musicology and a PhD yeah. in ethnomusicology. And this is what I was going to do. And um, I think I'm a smart guy. <laughs> I stare at the neck on a 10 string pedal steel and I just go dumb, completely yeah. dumb. I have no idea. I was trying to look at it's not a fingering chart. We would call it on bass or guitar, a fingering chart, right? Like where all the notes are and how to make chords. Yeah. I try to do that for pedal steel. I need someone to explain to me how to understand the chart. Sure. I don't, yeah. I don't get it. I, I think that there are very few pedal steel players who know the difference between a German Italian and French augmented six chord. Oh. Um, and so I think that you, you may be thinking too much and you just go for it. Cause a lot of the pedal steel guys that I know, like, they don't read very well. They just have played a ton. They just play all the time. Yeah, and, and they're just, weirdos. You Sorry, just triggered a third that. semester music theory uh, <laughs> trauma. Um, I I still have a very specific mnemonic device to remember the difference. Between. I'm not going to go into it because that is not what this podcast is. But we'll do that for the Patreons. We'll yeah, we'll do that for the Patreon. We will explain to you how to understand augmented yeah. sixth chords and the variations. Yeah. And Perfect. we'll explain how a German augmented sixth is actually a, can be a secondary dominant it, 
to change keys. Neither here nor there. Um, that's way more than any. I'm so sorry, listeners, for that. that oh digression. my god! <laughs> right, apologize to me. Apologize to yeah, me. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Andrew. So, so let's talk about uh, speaking of what's next. So you take over Brown Box Amp RX. You've got an established product already. Um, what, now that you've sort of been doing this for just a little bit, are there thoughts of what do we do now? Because you don't want to rest on the one product. I realize there's variations, there's rack mount versions, and there's you know bigger applications than just the one small brown box. But have have you thought about where you want to take it next from there? I mean, obviously you've thought about it. Yeah, we've thought about it. I mean, we think about that kind of stuff all the time, actually, because you know, whenever you when you talk to business people, the very first question is what's your exit strategy? Yeah. <laughs> they want to know about the end of the story before we even talk about what we're doing today. So um, for us, the first year was really making sure we had everything nailed down to be able to make them really efficiently, like not make mistakes, get the business sorted out. Like I was like QuickBooks queen, like, you know, just get everything in order and in line. And then we started making improvements on what was already existing. Um, now we have a really, really solid product that we can make really well and really effective, efficiently, um, accurately, precisely. And uh, we are working on educating people. So, you know, you've found out about us and you've seen our presence more, but I still think that we have only scratched the surface when it comes to letting people know who we are and what we do. So, um, you know, the mission to educate and get the brand more well-known is, is active. We're just at the beginning, I think. And we are spending a considerable amount of energy on product development. Yeah. That's a, that's a great little, just, Hey, there's stuff. I, stuff, yeah. I, I will say that's not uh, power related and something that we actually are working on uh, today and have been working on. Um, uh, a gentleman um, approached me to uh, play a gig over a year ago. His name is Mitch. And um, I said no to the gig. And then he was like, are you the brown box guy? And I was like, I know her. <laughs> but I'm not a vibe, but I know. Her. Um, and so he's like, I have something that I need to manufacture and I want you to check it out. And um, this is a product that I can talk about. Um, okay. It is a harmonica microphone. Oh. So traditionally harmonica, you have a bullet microphone that goes in front of it and you have the people in their hand. You have the cupping technique and all of that. And this guy, out of necessity, just like Pat, he's a rack player. So he plays guitar, mm -hmm. but he plays with a rack, and he couldn't get the blues sound, the Chicago harmonica blues sound, because he can't cup his hands right. and play guitar at the same time. So he has developed a device that is in a, a, an aluminum uh, enclosure. We have familiarity with aluminum enclosures and it is a condenser microphone on a printed circuit board along with a lot of other things yeah like a guitar pedal okay so he said if i have a guitar pedal with a microphone i should put a drive channel so it has a drive channel in it and then he made 200 of them and people were like, well, one of my favorite things about a harmonica is that thing. And you can't do that if it's in a metal enclosure. So right. we added an infrared sensor on the top of the enclosure. And it open and closes a filter to where it sounds like this. That's awesome. So, like... <laughs> As a blues player, as someone who came from that Mississippi Delta blues culture yeah. and can't play harmonica to save my life, mine's sitting right there that I've been trying to learn. Um, I like there's literally a shop in Clarksdale, Mississippi that is just a harmonica shop. 
Great. <laughs> That's what they do. And so okay. I hang out with those guys and I know all their struggles. Yeah. And that, that's a wild contraption. So you have tons of feedback if you are doing harmonica. It's like typically like a cheap microphone into an amp, straight into an amp. Um, there's all kinds of different issues. And this thing basically is a boutique streamlined product that will deliver that bluesy sound. Yeah. And it's quarter inch, so you can plug it into a pedal board if you want to. You could also you sing do, into it you if you don't have to. Right? Just yeah. go direct or yeah. to an amp or whatever. You could also just bring it and go into a DI and you wouldn't have to bring an amplifier. So that's that's, so that's cool. like the new exciting thing that's not power related that we are working on. It's interesting being in Nashville. There's a lot of people moving here. Like there's a train city. Yeah, I know. That have found out that like we are doing manufacturing. And so like we get to see manufacturing. We get to, we have manufacturing friends here in town as well. Um, and that's a different just aspect of something that we get to be a part of. That's really rad. I really yeah. love that. I love harmonica microphones. I even as someone who's not a harmonica player yeah, or at least not a good one. I actually recently discovered, I'll, I'll talk about this for a second. Cause I was worried you're going to say something similar. It just happens to be on my desk. I've been doing my, uh, any, my solo shows that I play, I've been doing them with just my super reverb and that's my PA. I plug my oh. guitar into the vibrato channel and I plug a harmonica mic into the normal channel. Oh, I, well, wow. I go through a, I go through a reverb pedal cause I want reverb on the mic as well, but yeah. I don't want them in the same channel. Um, my problem was always, I couldn't put a bullet on a mic stand cause they just don't. And so I, I used to take, um, I don't have one right now, but you know, just like a wall mount guitar hanger. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the static ones, not like the Hercules ones, Her Hercules brand ones. I turned it upside down and it will hold a, uh, bullet microphone perfectly. And I would wow. just rubber band around it. And I drilled a hole in the boom of my mic stand so I could mount it directly into there. Wow. And that's what I did. But then I found, then I found these that I'd see if it'll focus. It's called ammo clip. Okay. I don't think my camera. Oh, look, look at that. Interesting. And so it perfectly fits a bullet style microphone and you can just mount it on a mic stand. Nice. So that's what I've been singing into um, cool. for my solo gigs. Cool. I just, that's rad. I think harmonica microphones just sound rad. You can do whatever you want into them. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So here in the last few minutes, as we start to wrap up, um, before we head over to Patreon, where we're going to talk about German sixths. And uh, we're also going to talk about uh, our own personal music gear and, and geek out a little bit about that kind of stuff and a little less about the technical side of things. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, I like that. yeah. I, that's where I ask all the fun questions. We we do all the like we do all the like business stuff here on the main end, and then on Patreon we could talk about the the crazy fun stuff. Uh, cool. Listeners, as usual, you know that if you want to catch the Patreon exclusive episode, you can go over to patreon.com slash forty watt podcast. Five dollars a month gets you an extra episode every week or every week that I put out an episode. Y'all, I know I skip some weeks sometimes. I got a real job. You know, it's life. Um, uh, so you talked about what you got coming up. Where can people find you? Um, and sure. so tell our listeners, where can they find you? Where can they purchase Brown Box? Where can they find you on the internet, social media, YouTube, all those things? If you would like to purchase a Brown Box, uh, we uh, sell them on our website, but you can also buy them at Sweetwater and Guitar Center and Musician's Friend and Stu Mac. And uh, anywhere else you'd like to buy? Lots of local shops. A Absolutely. Lot of, uh, lots of shops in Nashville. We have shops all over the U.S. We have shops in Canada. Um, and, you know, we have an international version, too. So you can, if you're if you're overseas listening, you can get one from Peach Guitars in the U.K., Deluxe Guitars in Australia. We're kind of, like, getting all four, four, four corners of the U of the world these days. So it's uh, pretty good, but we're um, active on Instagram. If you send me a Facebook message, I probably won't get it. <laughs> uh, don't do that, but you can always contact us through our website or Instagram and YouTube. Awesome. Yeah. So what's the YouTube? Is it amp.rx? So yeah, like we talked about earlier, um, Brown Box is our most popular product. Most people know us by brown box but our company's name is actually amp rx so if you want to find us brown box will probably get you there but amp rx will definitely get you there yeah 
And to make it absolutely as simple as possible, both Instagram and YouTube are down in the show notes. So if you're watching on YouTube uh, sure. or you're listening in uh, your favorite podcast player, they're down in the notes. Uh, while you're down in that area, click subscribe. If you aren't already subscribed, uh, click follow um, whatever all whatever the platform you're using tells you to do. Please do it. And it helps. Uh, and I haven't asked this in a while, listeners. Uh, leave a review. I haven't gotten a review in a while. Um, if it's good, if it's bad, keep it to yourselves. That's what your mama said. That's what, you know, uh, you can't say anything nice. Don't say it at all. Um, but yeah. So anything before we get ready to head over to, uh, Patreon. Hmm. Final parting notes. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us on. Yeah. Thank you very much. Part of the best part of, you know, one of the best parts of taking over the company is all the fine folks that we've gotten to meet over the last couple of years and you know we got some grumpy people on the line but it's actually more cool people than there are grumpy people so 100 percent. we appreciate right. people like you uh talking to the fine people out there about their gear and you know what we all just love this stuff so the best thing about a brown box for me is that when somebody gets it uh, a lot of times they just sit down and play their instrument for a few hours you know, and that's like what we're all doing, right? Yeah. Isn't that what we, what the whole hope of all of this is? Just play yeah. your instrument more? Totally. And yep. fixate on gear less? And I enjoy try. it more, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're going to head over to Patreon. Listeners, watchers, thank you all for joining us. Uh, remember, as usual, be good to yourselves, be kind to each other, and make some noise. This episode is brought to you by the supporters of 40 Watt Podcast over on Patreon. Go over to patreon.com slash 40 Watt Podcast, where for as little as $3 per month, you can help support the podcast and get every episode ad-free. For $5 a month, you'll get every episode ad-free, as well as a bonus episode every week. I can't overstate how thankful I am for the support of my patrons, and hope you'll consider joining the team and helping keep this show on the road.